It is Friday, August 5th. Let's talk PlayStation. All right, everyone, welcome back. We've got some interesting topics here this week. We've got Sony's uh, fiscal year 2022 Q1 report and also uh, Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard, where they're speaking with regulators directly. And so we've got um, some interesting answers between Microsoft, Sony, other publishers, a lot of uh, really cool stuff that we'll get into later. But uh, first, as always, our PS Plus reminder. So the August PS Plus Essential Games are now live. Go grab them. And for our first story, <coughs> excuse me, let's talk about the PS5 accolades feature because well, uh, just saying that, some folks don't even know what it is, and if you do, you've never used it, or you, you've hardly used it, uh, or maybe you forgot about it entirely, because Sony's already retiring this feature because nobody was using it. So if you remember when PS5 came out, this was an early feature that they were not really pushing hard per se, but if a multiplayer game supported this feature, you could hand out accolades to people that weren't your friends, so it had to be a more organic way to encourage more friendly behavior online, and you can give somebody an accolade and say they were a good player, they were helpful, uh, they were a leader, and nobody was using this, so they recently put out a notice on their... Um, the official PlayStation site where it's uh, it's that web page where it's about notices of you know retiring features and initiatives and it looks like the first PS5 related item is now on there it's accolades it's being retired come fall of this year so I would assume the current beta firmware that uh, is available when it goes live for everyone they're just going to take this out of player profiles I don't blame them because, uh, again, I can't speak too much on it. I don't play a lot of multiplayer stuff, but I thought this feature was kind of silly and, well, dumb because nobody's going to use it, and uh, that seems to be the case. Moving on to our next story, I want to uh, quickly apologize about this because I completely lost my concept of time on this story. It came out right after an LTPS episode, which I thought was last week, but really it was uh, two weeks ago, and I don't know how I thought of it that way, but... Uh, yeah, I was supposed to talk about this last week. Sorry, we'll bring we'll bring it up now though because it's still pretty important. It's a you know a quick PSA about some online servers for some uh, Guerrilla Games titles. Recently, they put this out on Twitter where they announced on August 12th the online servers are getting shut down for Killzone Mercenary, Shadowfall, and Rig's uh, Mechanized Combat League, which is the uh, PSVR title, and uh, those games are having their servers shut down very soon. Which um, you know, I will always be the first person to admit and say, like, very old games are eventually going to have their servers shut down. It's inevitable. We can't get too upset about it. It's going to happen at some point. The vast majority of devs are not going to go out of their way to set up some sort of, uh, if they haven't before, set up some sort of peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, so people can keep playing that way or, you know, patching out online trophies. More often than not, it just it doesn't happen. It's going to shut down at some point. Uh, but what really sucks here is that it was such a short notice. So even two weeks ago when this was announced on July 22nd, that's still only a, you know, what, three, three and a half week notice or something. And that just, you know, is a huge bummer, especially since it's in the uh, EULA agreement when you sign up to play these games online that they're going to try and give you a notice of at least 90 days, which did not happen here at all. Ideally, it should be, you know, six months to a year. That would be great. But yeah, this uh, was pretty bogus, and uh, now there's only, you know, a few days left to play these games online and also go for their online trophies, which um, Killzone Shadowfall back in 2014 and 2015, I tried to, you know, organically play that game because I did enjoy it, and so I wanted the Platinum, but it became too much of a grind, and I just, you know, gave up on it. And now I'm seeing some folks are able to knock it out with the bots, which is good, but I, I don't think that's going to be feasible for me. Killzone Mercenary, on the other hand, I'm close, so I think I'm going to be doing that this weekend. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, and uh, I'll put out a tweet or something when I'm playing the game online if you want to um, see if we can run into each other. It should be easy with the small player pool, but um, yeah, that was uh, definitely disappointing. So final PSA, play those games online before they're shut down. Next up, let's go over some Sony financials. We've got their uh, latest report, which will be Q1 2022, and that would cover April to June 30th. And, uh, you know, over the years, we've covered plenty of financial reports, and I'd say the last 
4 or 5, they've been largely, you know, positive because PS4 was doing so well, then going into PS5, and, you know, this time around, eh, not so much the case, but there's reasons for that. So, uh, first, PS5 unit shipped worldwide has crossed over 21.7 million, which, you know, that is units shipped, not sold to consumers, but as we often say about PS5 numbers, um, even if it's shipped, they're going to get sold at some point very soon, so... They're at about 21.7 million, and uh, for that quarter, that would be 2.4 million sold, so about 100,000 more year over year. And also, they did not report PS4 hardware for what I would assume is the first time ever, uh, or at least when you would expect them to. It's not here, so for comparison's sake, last quarter, they only shipped 100,000 units, so this might be the end for PS4's numbers. We'll have to wait and see on that, but uh, for PS Plus subscribers, that hit 47.3 million, which would be up from the same time last year, but still not at the peak of 48 million from Q3 2021. Also, there's no new info on the PS Plus revamped tiers, but that was uh, you know a little bit too soon, so that will likely come next quarter. The digital software ratio was a whopping 79% this quarter, comfortably ahead of physical sales, which you know it's bound to happen at some point. But um, I'm sure COVID still definitely played a role in you know ingraining those habits even more for consumers to choose uh, digital over physical. And uh, as for the breakdown of the games and network services segment, they did see a big drop in operating income. So that was down 30.5 billion yen year on year due to what Sony says is lower software sales and also rising game development costs. Upcoming forecasts were also reduced to account for these changes that they expect to be around for the fiscal year. Another big point here is a decrease in user engagement and playtime, down 15% year on year. Sony thinks the drop is largely attributed to users being able to go outside with a decrease in COVID-19 lockdowns. And to combat this, they'll be releasing major first party titles, uh, which we already know what those are, increasing PS5 supply and promoting the new PS Plus tiers. There's also no change to the 18 million PS5 sales forecast for fiscal year 2022. They're hoping to bring in more supply though for this holiday season. And that's largely the main data points for this particular report, which we can see. It's not terrible per se, but um, certainly it's uncharacteristic of Sony where, again, the past four or five years, they've uh, had mostly positive reports to put out there where it's like they're making all this money, they're breaking records, uh, both internally and across the board in this industry. And what we're seeing now happen to Sony, and not just Sony, but other publishers, and platform holders as well is that the COVID highs are coming down and so uh, the whole COVID situation was particularly unique and helpful to the entertainment sector and the interactive entertainment sector where uh, people were at home playing games buying games and engaging uh, a lot right and so even last year was still something where um, plenty of travel bans and notices and you can't uh, travel outside the country. Many live events and concerts still did not return and, you know, conventions and things like that. And so at least for this year, that's finally, at least in my experience, and I'm sure many of you as well, but it depends largely on where you are, um, that is starting to change. And so not only are restrictions being lifted, but events are finally coming back. And well, especially in a, in a cold weather climate like where I'm at, spring going into summer, and you know people are eager to get out of the house and go do something. So uh, there's that, but there's also the fact that we are in kind of this, uh, you know, financial, not crisis, but a situation where inflation is just nuts and interest rates are high. Um, so now, you know, money isn't, you know, money isn't as abundant as it was uh, recently. So people are, you know, less likely to spend or invest or, you know, use discretionary income in some way. And so they might also be, you know, less encouraged to, uh, let's say they're not traveling and going out and, and enjoying themselves. Then if they're not doing that, then they might be less inclined to also stay home and buy a bunch of video games and play on their PS5. But, um, you know, there's many, many reasons for it, and uh, these reasons are hitting not just Sony, but everybody, and at least with Sony, it's something where, because they were so high, the drop-off might hit them, you know, a little bit more compared to others. Uh, although I think EA did put out a pretty good report recently, that was, uh, but that was also uh, likely due to their, I think it was the live service stuff, which is why they uh, did so well. But for the most part, other publishers and platform holders, it's the, the same situation. The COVID highs are definitely coming down and we're seeing it in this report uh, for sure. Now in terms of inflation, where that is a, a very real consequence of what's going on currently, 
and more so for the, uh, well, for electronics with the semiconductor shortage, where the bill of materials is rising for so many products, and in many cases, companies are choosing to pass that cost directly to the consumer. That's what happened recently with Sony, where they raised the MSRP on a lot of their electronics in Japan, and uh, that's why recently during their earnings call, they were asked this directly about the PS5. Uh, will PS5 see a price increase? So the uh, Sony CFO, Hiroki Totoki, said, and I quote here, about a potential price increase for the PS5 at this point in time, there is nothing specific I can share with you about prices, which is kind of a non-answer and certainly, I think, alarming on the surface, but there's a few things to note here. So um, first, Nintendo uh, did also comment on this as well, where they uh, put out a statement that they're not considering any price increases. That was a firm no. Um, Microsoft declined to comment as well. Uh, they didn't say anything, actually. So we've got two kind of non-answers and one direct no. But in the console space, of course, the model is a bit different. So at least, uh, well, with basic electronics, right, those do work on very thin margins. And oftentimes, it's a one-and-done sale. You're not, you know, monetizing the customer further. But consoles have never fit that model. Oftentimes, they are sold at a loss because uh, you don't care about losing money. You'll make that back and then some with software sales. And, uh, well, nowadays, the model is still the same. But there's one little difference and that's that uh, you know platform holders make way more money nowadays than they did you know even 10 15 20 years ago because there's a lot more ways to monetize now so yes they sell at a loss which even with ps5 um, already the disc console was uh, considered profitable who knows if that's the case uh, today maybe not or certainly it's it's close right um, and not sure with the uh, digital console, but either way, you know, they initially sell at a loss and uh, over time with the bill of materials staying largely the same, even during, you know, model revisions and even in a weird situation like PS4 Pro, that stays the same price. But during all of that, uh, what Sony does nowadays and what Microsoft and Nintendo also do is they sell software, but also those very lucrative online storefronts. So we're talking DLC, microtransactions, season passes. I mean, this is why PS5 is still a very conservatively designed console, but uh, it makes way more money and Sony's been making way more money in this generation than they did with the PlayStation 2, which was their most successful platform in terms of units sold. So the point I'm trying to get across here is that I wouldn't really worry too much about this. It's something where I'm sure Sony is very aware of how unusual it would be to raise the price of PS5 without offering anything else. Um, I think worst case scenario, you might see them do this in Japan where they could uh, possibly get away with it, but uh, more than likely they're going to continue doing what they're doing right now, which is offering not only base consoles of disc and digital, but also a bundle with uh, first party software. So right now they offer the Horizon bundle, which that represents a $20 savings if you buy them together, but it does increase the average spend per customer when selling a PS5. You're guaranteeing a software sale right off the top, and uh, in the short term, that might be what they're looking at and uh, continuing to do that and also I guess the other unusual thing is that we could see the price stay the same for a long time versus the expected price decreases that we often see in the console space so at the very minimum that could also be a consequence of this but uh, it's also important to note for you know Microsoft yeah they didn't really say anything but um, it wouldn't really surprise me at all if let's say the uh, rising costs certainly were a, a huge adverse effect on their bottom line but they choose to eat that cost to keep Series S and X at their uh, current price points and you don't want to be the only platform holder considering or or going going ahead with increasing prices on your console and nobody else is doing it right so given all of that I think uh, right now we shouldn't have too much to worry about now moving on to Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard and King Digital Entertainment uh, of course, right now, Microsoft is going through the approval process, trying to make sure they can speak with all the uh, relevant regulators across various countries to make sure the deal goes through. They're answering questions, providing rationale and feedback. And for all these regulators, they're reaching out to third parties in the related sector to find out if there's any sort of uh, unfair advantage that may come up or something like that. And at least for Brazil, what the Brazil government does is make these answers public which I did not know whatsoever, but it turns out they make a lot of this stuff public. It's uh, just all in Portuguese, but over on Reset Era, the user Idas has gone through all this. They read it, they translated it, so huge credit and kudos to them. 
but we did see the uh, answers that all these third parties uh, provided, which in terms of, uh, well, to provide the, the, the context here, so here's the kind of questions they were asked uh, directly. So things like, are subscription services like Game Pass a part of a broader distribution of digital content, or is it considered more specific? From the consumer's point of view, are subscription services considered as competition to individually buying games? Are there barriers of entry for making games in the console, PC, and mobile space? Does Activision Blizzard publish any titles that have no close competitors uh, published by other companies? And also, would it be possible that there's a reduction in rival Xbox consoles in the event of no availability of Activision Blizzard titles for those platforms? Now, there's still a lot of redacted info in the provided answers, but a lot of companies were asked, and here's what many of them said. So, uh, Warner Brothers feels there's no such barrier that prevents entry into this space, and Ubisoft feels Activision has no unique games because all games have close competitors, with all publishers competing for playtime alone. They also say subscription services should not be considered a different market. Uh, Bandai Namco says every game is unique and there are competitors today to Call of Duty such as Battlefield or Destiny. Uh, Riot Games says something similar. Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, and Candy Crush all have competitors. And interestingly, they mention Naughty Dog as a competitor to the proposed Activision Blizzard deal. They also think subscription services are part of the distribution market and that Microsoft would honor their public statements of multi-platform releases for some games. Now, Amazon, Apple, Meta, shockingly, they had very little to say, mostly redacted info, and they just didn't really say much. Uh, but when it comes to Sony, they obviously oppose the deal, so their answers are a bit more direct and firm. They say no other developers could create a rival franchise to Call of Duty, which stands out as a gaming category of its own. It's so popular that it influences consumer choice, and that because of its loyal fan base, a rival product just isn't possible even with the budget to make it happen. They also consider subscription services to be a competitor to individually buying games, and that it would take several years for a competitor to come in and be an effective rival to Game Pass. Now, as a separate new news story here that is on the complete opposite end of this, uh, of this story, um, in the case of Microsoft, they sent out an application to the Commerce Commission in New Zealand, uh, going over the deal, of course, and from Microsoft's point of view as to why this deal won't have any adverse effects, they say, and I quote here, with respect to Activision Blizzard video games, there is nothing unique about the video games developed and published by Activision Blizzard that is a must-have for rival PC and console video game distributors that could give rise to a foreclosure concern. Microsoft has demonstrated that it is not withdrawing content from other platforms, having made public statements that it will continue to make Call of Duty and other popular Activision Blizzard titles available on PlayStation through the term of any existing agreements and beyond. Microsoft has also publicly stated that it is interested in taking similar steps to support Nintendo's platform. So that, for the most part, was the big talking point this week, and it's easy to see why, because you've got Sony on record saying that Call of Duty is this massive franchise that's unrivaled, you can't recreate it, even with a big budget, um, no developer can do it, um, it's also highly influential to consumer decisions, and... It's not like they're wrong, obviously, because Call of Duty is a huge franchise. Even if you don't like it, it's something where, uh, and also despite the uh, falling player engagement where they did recently put out some numbers and they've lost a lot of players in recent years, but you know, even then, uh, poor Call of Duty years uh, move absolute units and consoles, and that's true. It's one of those games where it has broad market appeal, whether it's Call of Duty, Madden, FIFA, there are certain games that... They come out every year on time and they just move a crazy amount of consoles and, and software. And so for a lot of folks, you know, that is their decision is where can I play Call of Duty? Where can I play Madden? And that's all they need to know. Sony understands the importance of that. That's why back in uh, 2013, they got in bed with Activision for having brand alignment and marketing rights for the Call of Duty franchise on PlayStation. They wanted PlayStation to be the home of Call of Duty, or at least uh, make it appear that way. And so we had it throughout the entire PS4 cycle and also going into PS5. They still have an agreement for the next uh, two games, apparently. But, you know, Sony's on the cusp of losing that and so of course they are going to be opposed to this deal and provide these kind of answers and other publishers where they're not platform holders are going to be more neutral with their answers but um not surprising at all 
And then, <clears throat> excuse me, on the flip side, you've got Microsoft where, you know, they're on the defense, right? They want the deal to go through for their own interests. So they have to downplay the importance of Activision Blizzard, saying things like they don't have any must-have games. Oh, no, they're fine. These are normal titles. Um, we're just competing in the space. And also we've made public statements about how we will honor agreements and continue to do multi-platform stuff, which um, they have. And they also have a history, right, with Minecraft. So they've got evidence to provide regular Regulators of here's how we handled this other big franchise if there is some sort of questioning about well what about Call of Duty will you still ship that on PlayStation they're certainly playing the game too you've got lawyers doing their jobs at Microsoft and Sony that's what's at play here but um, looking at Microsoft as I said right when that deal was announced I don't see how it doesn't go through um, but certainly it seems they will uphold a lot of what they've been saying in public which is continuing multi-platform releases which you know in the grand scheme of things might be the best way to go about doing it i still feel it's a you can have your cake and eat it too situation of you don't have to make call of duty exclusive you can sell it for 70 bucks on playstation and it's day one on game pass right that's how i've always felt about it i don't think that looks bad either way because you're going to make money off your competitor and then you get to you know really showcase a value proposition for for game pass but regardless of that um that's what came out recently was uh, those answers given to uh, the brazil government now while we're talking about acquisitions for publishers we can also briefly mention that the uh, ea ceo andrew wilson mentioned during an earnings call that they are going to stay independent so they more or less addressed any sort of acquisition rumors saying that once the uh, Activision Blizzard deal goes through, they will be the largest single independent uh, publisher and developer in this business. And they feel good about that. They're independent, they're strong, and uh, they're in a very good position, which they are based on their recent report. And then on the other side of, uh, well, another publisher, Ubisoft, it looks like uh, Tencent is going to be increasing their uh, stake in Ubisoft. So right now they have about a 5% stake and they're looking to increase that even more, which would, uh, well, even prior to that, the Guillemont family made it seem pretty obvious that they weren't they were not interested in selling or you know letting go or giving up control of the business and so now something is going on with tencent which i, I guess they're okay with that eh, don't really know that news like just dropped but in terms of two massive publishers on the market right now it looks like those two aren't really uh seemingly they're not going anywhere uh, anytime soon now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Support on this channel. A number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories that I wanted to talk about you all from this past week. And our Tuesday video was looking at the recent PS5 beta firmware where it seems obvious Sony's really trying to highlight and push the uh, bespoke PS5 features that we've had since launch. So go check out that conversation. And uh, coming up as always, another upload on Tuesday. But until then, that is it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Bonecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me and I will see you all next Friday.